All right. Good, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. My name is James Crampton. I'm owner of Rocketry Works uh, here in Tucson, Arizona. And uh, this session is uh, we're going to talk about level one build certification. And uh, interestingly enough, we started out uh, planning to do, you know, basically put your kids in front of the TV and, and watch a build. Uh, and we wound up realizing that there's no way to really condense this into 45 minutes that could make some meaningful progress on that. So we're going to talk. We have that video available to you after the presentation, but we're going to talk a lot about the context of high power certification and uh, key key things to keep in mind when you're working up to your level one cert. Uh, and also we'll talk specifically about some deviations and clarifications to the instructions for the SBR uh, three inch fusion, which uh, which is has a special edition for our virtual Narcon. So um, I'm going to be monitoring chat during this. Um, we're kind of going to work through the presentation and have a little Q&A at the end. So if you have questions, uh, the Q&A tab is where to put them. Um, but with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so on the agenda today, here's kind of how, what I want to talk through. Uh, first of all, um, there's some warning signs that I just as a as a business owner and a, I'm also president of Southern Arizona Rocketry Association. There are some warning signs when we get people coming out uh, who are really not looking at certification in the right ways. I'd like to talk about some of those um, and really talk about what is high power. What are some of the legal contexts and uh, and what are the practical differences between high power and low power rocketry? I want to demonstrate some software modeling. We're going to look, be looking mainly at thrust curve to show how you can really quickly try before you fly. And it, saves, it makes it a lot safer and saves you a lot of money on, on motors and, and crashed rockets. Uh, and we're going to talk specifically about using thrust curve for motor selection uh, assistance because it's, it's a great database of uh, motor information. We're going to talk some about range selection too. Now, one of our key recommendations in high power flying is join up with the NAR section. Uh, there's a lot of people there that are going to be able to help you, um, mentor you, and you know take care of the, lo uh, the logistics in flying high power. Um, that's going to make it a lot easier. But if you're out there either helping in our section pick a field or trying to you know even go out and flying your own model rockets, uh, I've got a bunch of tips on how to easily find places to fly. And then finally, we're going to talk about the, that uh, three-inch fusion build, uh, some of the best practices. Uh, techniques that differ between low power and, and, and high power. Um, and uh, there is a full length video that we'll be uh, linking in there as well. So let's start with, uh, I don't know, these, are, these can be funny when you look at them in the right sense. Um, chief thing is red, you know, and the red flags is, you know, I, I get guys probably once a month call up and the guy says, what's the biggest motor I can fly without a license? And when they say license, right away, I know they haven't even done enough research to know that it's called certification. So this is kind of a guy that I've got to offer some warnings to. Um, so it happens. Uh, the key thing is it's not about flying a big motor. Uh, it's about flying the right motor for the conditions and for the rocket you're flying. Uh, and a lot of that is about what we're going to talk about today. Um, and you, re you really have to think through the consequences of what happens if it does go wrong. You know, am I flying at a location that's like right next to an interstate freeway uh, where my rocket could recover on the freeway and have immediate dangerous consequences for traffic? Um, you know, as much as neither is a good outcome, what if a rocket crashes on that highway or what if it crashes onto a neighboring property? So these are things you need to consider. They have different risks associated with them, but ultimately as a flyer, you're responsible for those risks. Uh, you also hear people that kind of want to build a rocket and I oh, just want to put a motor in it and see if it's stable. Well, there's actually a lot of lot better ways to do that, do that through software modeling. And uh, we're going to show really some pretty simple, straightforward and accessible ways to do that. Uh, you can also hook up with an R section and find a mentor uh, where you don't have to take those kind of risks of just putting a motor in it. Because you got to think about what can go wrong, right? That thing can go totally unstable, land in the grass and start a fire. And guess who's liable for that? It's the flyer. And uh, insurance is present for certain things, but if you're violating the high power safety code, you're not going to be covered. And the thing I see a lot is guys that are out looking to looking to complete their their shopping list. And their shopping list is that I want to be level three certified by you know three months from now. 
And those are guys that, that worry me. Um, you know, you don't show up to try to do your level one and level two certs in a day. It's just, there's a lot of experience that you gain by flying, flying high power repeatedly. And honestly, some of the biggest lessons I've learned have been uh, that weekend in New Mexico when I crashed my level one and level two cert, flight, or cert rockets, it's certified a year before, but I went out there and I made mistakes and, and I lost both those rockets that day. Um, you'll learn a lot. It's, it's frustrating, but crashes are learning opportunities. And I'd rather see someone go out and do a level one and then six or 12 months later with, you know, a dozen uh, high power flights under their belt. Now you're talking about level two. Uh, that's much, much preferable in terms of the safety and the knowledge that you're going to bring. Now, generally speaking, what we're talking about in high power rocketry are rockets that weigh more than 1500 grams and are carrying uh, more than 125 grams of propellant. Uh, you're also in high power range when you have more than 80 newtons of average thrust, uh, or you're using a motor that has more than 160 newton seconds of total impulse. Now, total impulse is a measure of your total power. So it's the amount of energy you're putting into the sky. Uh, interestingly enough, you could fly multiple smaller motors that are below 160 newtons, uh, com but combined uh, uh, have, have uh, 320 newtons but you can go all the way up to 320 newtons with a pair of motors. Uh, you can't certify on a cluster of motors, so that's not really a consideration for a cert flight. And really for cert flights, everything, all the rules, of, all the guidance about it is keep it simple, right? I don't even like to fly things like shoot release on cert flights unless we really have to, uh, simply because it's one more thing to go wrong. I love shoot releases and they've, they've made things uh, fabulously better in so many ways, but for cert flights, I try to keep it simple. Um, other things that, that put you into high power territory are hybrid or sparky motors. So even though there's, there's sparky motors down to the F range, uh, if you're flying sparkies, you need to be certified. And you can't certify on an F or a G motor, so you're going to have to fly that H motor first. It can be a sparky if, if your field conditions permit it, but you're going to then have to uh, uh, step it back down once you're certified to fly that F sparky. And really any airframe parts of ductile metal. And this seems to be a really gray area, a lot of interpretations on what this means, but by and large, you know, model rockets are made of, of lightweight and relatively safe materials. In fact, they come into, into three classes. Your class one rockets are model rockets. Uh, you know, and that's sort of each of these classes extends the other. So you start with class one and then you add some other requirements for two and three. And these are not about motor classes. These are about the classes of rockets. Uh, so they're made of paper and wood, plastic, uh, no substantial metal parts. Again, that gray area, what is substantial? Uh, there's a bunch of debate about that. Uh, contains slow burning propellant. And for all practical purposes, ammonium perchlorate or black powder, they have some different properties, but they're both considered slow burning. So those are the basics of what's, you know, what's a model rocket. Uh, class two rockets are where high power comes in. And that's everything in class one, plus uh, if your rocket's more than 1500 grams or uh, has 125 grams of total installed propellant. And then the, the range we're really talking about today is this range of class two rockets that goes all the way up uh, through O power. Uh, now there's three different levels of certification, um, but there is, just be aware that there is a class three rocket category that is for P motors and higher. So what we're going to be talking about today are our basic certification uh, flights in class two. Now, there are a number of regulatory frameworks that factor in here. Um, NFPA 1122 and 1127 and certain parts of uh, the Code of Federal Regulations, uh, part 101, uh, that pertain to amateur rockets. Now, this is sort of broadly sectioned under FAA responsibilities, uh, which cover, you know, this whole section covers balloons and kites and rockets. Uh, but, uh, so there's a couple sections in there. All those are really arcane regulations. You if you want to read them, you'll learn a lot. But really, they're all rolled up into plain language uh, that we have uh, from NAR, Tripoli, uh, Canadian Rocketry Association. Um, and the I've got the NAR codes listed here. There's actually three NAR safety codes. One's for low power rockets or model rockets. The other's for high power rockets and the other's for um, RC control. 
So anytime you're operating a glider that's RC based, there's a separate safety code for that. So these are just plain language. They're easier to understand. And, uh, you know, you're just going to be, uh, that's a good place to start. If you're in line with those, you're not going to be grossly wrong with any of the federal regulations, but you do learn a lot by reading those. So the question of when and where to fly high power. Um, first of all, just fly in accordance with the high power safety code. It's there to give you plain guidance on, on how, to, how to fly safely. If you think you've got a rocket that's pushing the boundaries, get some help from an R section. Someone can tell you, yeah, that's really not gonna be all right. And they're gonna help you ed educate you on why. Um, keep in mind that there are several H motors. A lot of people think high power rocketry is all about getting an FAA waiver. And that's not necessarily true. There's two sides of this. There's, and again, it's where NFPA, which is the National Fire Protection Association, and the FAA kind of, they, they overlap in this field. Um, there's a bunch of H motors that have less than 125 grams of propellant. So if you put that in a rocket that's pad weight, that is the rocket plus the motor is less than 1500 grams, you don't need an FAA waiver for that. But most H motors and pretty much everything uh, larger than H is going to require an FAA waiver. And so working with an R section is really going to be uh, an easier way to take care of the, the logistics. Uh, so you don't have to apply for your own FAA waiver and make sure your field is suitable. Uh, that's what sections are here for. And, and they're here to help mentor you as well. So you're going to have educational learning there. Um, keep in mind that even if you think you've got a field to fly, you show up at your NAR section and you're ready for your cert and they tell you, sorry, we can't do it today because the winds are too high or the fire danger is too high. Um, that does happen. Um, it could be also that there's some fly-in from your local ultralight club. And, you know, manned flight is always going to take precedence over unmanned flight. So um, it is ultimately your responsibility as a flyer to make sure that you're complying with that safety code and that you are being safe. And sometimes the safety issues aren't even in the safety code. It's just a matter of, hey, there's Cub Scouts playing all over here and, and we're not going to be able to fly this today. So there's ways around it, but it's, it's important to try to keep that perspective. So software modeling, um, there's a lot of programs out there from high power engineering software that you may see in college or, in, or at work um, to open source packages like OpenRocket, which is free and it's well maintained and it's, and it's really quite good. Uh, there's a commercial package, um, the Apogee Component Cells, uh, that's also excellent, uh, has, you know, the two packages have some different strengths and weaknesses. Um, I encourage you to get familiar with them and use them. They'll, basically, you can use them to build your rocket up from individual components, get a pretty good estimate of its weight, and to start looking at what motors are going to work well for that. You'll figure out there if your rocket is stable. Um, and that's a key thing, right? That try before you fly is really, really helpful. You need to be knowing about the mass, the center of gravity, center of pressure. Um, and then you want to be learning that some of the key safety metrics you're going to get out of software is pad departure speed, uh, parachute deployment speed, altitude, uh, what that optimal delay for your motor is going to be. Um, now you can get to these through these specific you know, desktop software features, but what we're going to demonstrate today is actually just out there on the web at thrustcurve.org. Uh, it has a pretty simplified model, which frankly doesn't differ a lot from the more sophisticated models. There are definitely edge cases where Specialized software is more effective, but thrust curve is really good at getting your basic three fins and a nose cone model down. It's got an extensive database of motor data, uh, including the thrust curve, the actual thrust over time curve uh, that's used in the certification process for motors. And then it's highly searchable with some really great motor selection features that we're about to look through. Um, and really the reason we're looking through this is we're trying to do a couple things. We want to know how high a rocket is going to fly. And well, that's going to depend on what motor you choose. And so motor selection really comes down to a number of considerations that aren't always as obvious uh, in low power. Uh, because you, if you fly an A motor, you fly an A motor, and they're all sort of pretty much the same. Now, again, there's some minor differences when you're in extreme competition. But you know the bottom line is if you take your SS Alpha and fly it on a83 or an A85, it's going to perform pretty similarly. One's going to be a little before ejection, and the others—I'm uh, sorry—it's going to eject a little before apogee, and the other's going to eject a little after. 
there's not a lot of difference between an A10 and an A8 uh, in terms of thrust characteristics that are going to affect your rocket in, in most senses. But you start getting up into mid power and certainly high power and you have, you've, you've doubled your power each letter of the alphabet. And that means you've also doubled your range. So it's start, up in mid and high power, you can have a small H motor or a big H motor uh, that's gonna have a widely different performance characteristic uh, depending on how much total impulse you have in there. So that's gonna basically double your altitude depending on what motor you choose. Um, and so they can vary differently even within the same impulse class of H or I motors. And there's a bunch of features that we're gonna be looking at here like total impulse, maximum thrust, average thrust, the burn time, and how all those map out on a graph. Uh, you've also got propellant types. You've got different colors, you've got sparkies, you've got uh, slow burns versus long burns, um, and a variety of delay options. Uh, you can actually delay, you know, drill the delays out on a lot of these motors so that you can be fairly customized in, in how you are, how long you are letting your rocket coast up to Apogee. And you can also have reloadable or single use high power motors. And of course, the size of the motors can vary. You can have H motors ranging from uh, 29 millimeter uh, or 38 millimeter. That's the most common range. Uh, there's 38 millimeter J's. There's 54 millimeter J's. It's, it's a wide variety depending on what your model can support and what you're trying to do. All right, so we're going to take a look over at thrustcurve.org. Um, so thrustcurve.org is and basically an open source website. We've got a variety of individuals who are contributing to this site and they've put in an enormous amount of work and in the last year made some really pretty impressive improvements. The area we're gonna be looking at specifically is this idea that we can log in. So you see, I have a My Stuff section. Um, so I've actually saved a number of rockets and uh, I can go to that list and I can choose this particular rocket and I can, um, go and you know, match a rocket, I can say, all right, I wanna look at all H motors. Uh, let's say just from Aerotech, just to keep the population down. I happen to be at 2,600 feet at my launch site, and I'm gonna determine what my stable velocity is in feet per second. 50 is a good place to look, but if you've got a high crosswind, you may want to bump that up a little bit uh, because higher crosswinds are gonna create a greater angle of attack and you're going to need to be getting off that pad faster. Uh, but let's assume fairly calm winds and you can get this list of, of results. Um, and th these are basically, these are all motors. And I see right now that they are sorted by Apogee. So basically the, the highest point on these. So for my 722 gram Fusion 3 inch rocket, um, an H283 is going to fly the lowest at 2,299 feet of the H motors we were looking at. And uh, the highest is going to be an H170. And so that kind of at 3,300 feet. So, you know, you're getting an extra thousand feet uh, based on how much total impulse your motor has. But there's a lot of other factors into that, right? I don't know that I would go and fly the H283 on this rocket because its thrust to weight ratio is 40 to 1, which is fine if you built it well, but that's hitting pretty hard. I like to see stuff in the 10 to 1 or 15 to 1 range. So I'd be looking at something more like the H148 or the, even the H170. If I'm willing to fly high on this flight, thrust to weight ratio of 16 to 1, yeah, that's, that's pretty good. Um, the guide column here indicates the velocity your rocket is leaving your guide. Now, one thing I want to do is back up and look at the parameters I set up on my rocket. So I'm going to edit my rocket. I listed this as three inch body diameter and a dry weight of 722 grams. Thrust curve is going to automatically calculate the, uh, the motor weight that is uh, uh, for each motor you pick. So you put in the dry weight, it's figuring out what the pad weight is. Um, it happens to have a 38 millimeter motor mount and a motor mount length of, I said 15 inches because that's basically the effective length of that tube. You can modify the coefficient of drag. And that's something that I, I'm always doing with my sims is I'll go out and I'll make the best simulation I can to come up with the best information I have without flying the thing. And then when I go and fly it, I find out I'm like, you know, 20% off on the projected altitude. So I'll go in there and I'll tweak the coefficient of drag so that my simulation 
better represents reality, assuming it was a nominal flight. And then my next flight should be more accurate. Now I indicated here a guide length of four and a half feet. And this is something that a lot of people overlook. They figure if they've got a six foot rail, uh, they're gonna have six feet of guidance, but that's not true. Because what you have to do is think about the effective guide length. And you know, for starters, I turn around here and grab our fusion rocket. We have a rail button down here at the aft end and we have a rail button up here. That's about 12 inches. So I've already lost 12 inches of my guide length as soon as this top button clears the, clears the rail. And uh, not only that, but below the rocket, uh, that rail is mounted into the, uh, into the launch pad somehow. And that's probably going to take up another 6 or 12 inches. So um, I have a pretty low profile pad that way. So I'm going to count this as 18 inches of that 6 foot rail that I've lost. Now, it's pretty common to have an 8 foot uh, guide line, uh, eight foot rail. So that could give you some extra. But right now we're having no problem finding plenty of motors that are um, that are going to match these these specifications. So we head back to match a rocket and get back to our list of H motors that we can certify on. I'm going to skip the base altitude because it doesn't really make much of a difference at most of our altitudes. But again, H283 is going to be the lowest total impulse motor, so it's going to perform the lowest, although we do see that by taking off that 2,600 feet, we've lost a couple hundred feet on our, on our projected altitude. But we're still clearing the guide safely. Uh, but again, 283 is going to hit pretty hard, and it's going to get that off super fast. So I'm more comfortable in something in a little bit lower, lower ranges, like in these 80s. But you see even the H100, which is a pretty slow motor, is going to put that off at 50 feet per second um, off of that four and a half foot guide length. So that's kind of, you know, th that's that's borderline low. Your H123 is a very common reload that, that people like to use. Um, and it's putting out about 2,500 feet. All told, these are clustered pretty tightly together. Um, but I would avoid some of the really, you know, insanely high uh, thrust weight ratios. Um, other things I'm looking at, or, you know, Apogee. I like to keep rockets for cert flights within sight, which typically means below 2,500 feet. So I want to get them up 1,000 feet. So we've actually got some time to see what's happening. Um, but under 2,500 feet, you know, I, I'm getting old and, and my eyes aren't working so well. So I want to see what happens. So if something goes wrong, we can kind of maximize what we learn out of that process. And I think 2,500 feet is a pretty good spot that way. Um, but keep in mind, whatever you're targeting here, it needs to be no more than 90% of the altitude at your launch site. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that's something that's, that's a factor because uh, you're basically not going to be allowed to fly if you're really pushing right up against that limit. Because what if your simulation is not right? What if you happen to build this with a really smooth surface and you wind up busting that waiver? You don't certify if you bust the waiver. The other thing I'm picking off of here is the delay time. So this, and this is one of the big benefits. These high power motors typically come with like a 13 to 14 or 15 second delay built into them. And what you do is you use a calibrated drilling tool to remove a certain amount of the delay grain so that it's going to fire your ejection charge a little bit quicker based on how much you remove. And so starting out at your, you know, say 14 second delay, uh, you know that you need to be back down at around nine seconds for most of these, nine or 10 seconds. Uh, you're going to need to be removing 14, uh, four seconds or so from your 14 second delay. Um, and so that's a really key, that's a really key element to, to working with this. Now I do want to kind of show you um, some of the data that's available in these individual uh, motor files. There's some interesting histogram data here that kind of gives you, you know, that idea about the total impulse in a motor. Where does this, where does this motor fall with respect to all of the uh, H motors that you can be flying from 160 Newton seconds up to 320. It's pretty much smack in the middle. So it's a very common, uh, kind of very, very average motor in that regard. There's a bunch that are very small. There's a bunch that are very large and there's a spread in the middle and this winds up right in the middle. In terms of average thrust, this is one of the lower ones. There's only a few that go really high, but it's definitely at the bottom of the bell curve. And in terms of its maximum thrust, it's right at the bottom. And we're gonna look at a couple of different curves for just a minute here, and we'll, we'll understand a little bit more about that. It's burn time is, there's, there's a wide range of burn times from here H13 up here at 15 seconds 
to most things that are down at a fraction of a second or around a second or two. Uh, and it's kind of in the middle of that curve. But we talk about maximum thrust, and that's where this uh, thrust curve comes in, because you can see the thrust over time curve for each of these motors. And the, H1, the H100 is a motor that kind of comes up to speed, not super fast, but you know, within a quarter of a second, it's pretty much up at its, at its maximum thrust. And it maintains that pretty constantly for most of its thrust for about another second. And then it starts to taper off somewhat gradually. Now, we can compare this to some other motors, and I'm going to pick on the H550. Uh, it has actually about the same thrust curve, but when we were, we were down here on the H100, uh, the H550 is maxing out way up here. I actually want to quickly duplicate this tab and look up a specific, specific motor, the F27. And you can do that just in this search. And this is not a high power motor, but it has a similar thrust curve and I guessed wrong. I'm gonna go to an F67, I keep guessing wrong. All these are motors that do about the same thing. They are, they come up to thrust, they maintain it, and then they shut down. Here's an easy one that I know is going to work, the D12. And this is common with a lot of black powder motors. They have a high initial thrust, and then they drop down to kind of a maintenance thrust. And the goal of that is to get it off the pad early. One of the key things that's different about this is all those other motors have been ammonium perchlorate motors, which tend to ignite much faster than black powder. Here you see it's taking a quarter of a second to get up to max thrust for most of our ammonium perchlorate motors are coming up to pretty substantial thrust, like here on the F67. Uh, they're coming up to full thrust within a tenth of a second. And so that's just a very different characteristic of, the, of those different propellants. So again, when I'm choosing the motor I want, I'm often looking first at Apogee, but then I'm going to check all my safety parameters. Is it going to be leaving the rails the rail at a fast speed? And the beauty is all of these do that. If I wanted to look at the complete list, it's going to identify some that don't get off the rail fast enough. And here we've got the H45, the H73, and the H112. Now it's interesting that the H112 doesn't get off the, the, the pad fast enough. It's very close. It's just under our threshold. You might consider that under the right circumstances, uh, but some of these others really do not. Um, and what I, yeah, what I expected to find here was the H13. Oh, and I know why I didn't. It's because we were looking just at 38 millimeter motors. You can fly this rocket with a 29 millimeter motor adapter, and you're going to be uh, you're going to be able to have a whole another set of motors, and the H13 is one of those. Um, and that just doesn't have enough thrust to get this rocket off the pad. So that is basically what I'm looking at when I when I look to thrust curve to do my motor selection. I want something that's going to fly in that right altitude range. It's going to get off the pad quickly, but not too quickly. There's no reason to tempt fate on your cert flight and just blow the fins off your rocket with a super high thrust motor. Um, but, you know, I might look at the H130 here, which is a pretty small motor, going to fly it to 2,200 feet, needs a nine-second delay. Now I know what to, what to drill my delay to. 14 to 1 thrust to weight ratio is good. So these are all pieces of data that you should know before, or before you show up for your cert flight, certainly. Um, but before you, talk, uh, before you show up for your cert flight, hopefully in an ideal world, you're actually talking with a mentor, and we're going to talk about that next. Um, you pretty much hit all those, all those things. Um, so we'll talk, we'll talk a little bit more about your, your, your cert day, uh, coming up, but right now I, um, I want to talk about range selection. So range selection may not really factor into your cert flight if you're just showing up at your local NAR site, but it never hurts to have a little bit of familiarity with things to consider and the tools you can use, uh, even just to go fly a model rocket at your, at your local park. Um, first of all, rely on the uh, high power and model rocket safety codes as guides. Um, reference those, they have things like minimum fuel dimensions. And keep in mind that minimum dimensions are one thing, uh, good dimensions are altogether another. Um, I like to use Google Maps as sort of a baseline. Um, where it's kind of the most accessible. The thing I use more often is Google Earth, which is free, um, but it's an application you have to download. It has slightly more sophisticated tools and it allows me to save a lot of the place marks that I'm working with. 
But I want to work first in Google Maps just to show you uh, what we want to work on. So in Google Maps, I've zoomed into uh, my, my son's grade school and middle school. Uh, as places with fields. Oftentimes going to a school is, is an easy place to get permission to fly. And getting permission to fly is a really key part of this. If you don't have permission to fly and something goes wrong, you can land in a world of hurt. Your liability is extreme. Starting a fire, damaging property, or even injuring somebody are all risks that you run. And so make sure you better to have permission than to seek forgiveness. Without paying attention, I opened Google Earth. I meant to open Google Maps. So here we go. Same location. Google Maps has a feature that I will clear right now. And I'm looking in, in the satellite view. And just to give you perspective, we've got the elementary school over here, the middle school over here. We've got some softball fields, a, a running track, and a, just like a big play field. Across the street, we've got National Forest Territory, which is nice and wide open, but we don't have permission to fly there. So that is out of bounds. There's a road that's not very busy. I like that because if something does land in that road because it overflew the field by mistake, uh, it's probably not going to cause a lot of damage uh, or cause problems in traffic. Uh, there's private property right nearby. I happen to know that there's a lot of people that use this track. And there's kids that are on the playground down here at the elementary school. So my favorite place to fly at this location is my softball fields. And zooming in there a little bit, there happens to be a fence up the middle, but that's my problem. You can walk around it. Tennis courts are often in use, so I will count this as my western boundary. And I can right click and select measure distance and come across here to where I get to the road shoulder. And I come up with my distance of about, uh, what is that, 200 feet? Yep, 200 feet across. So looking at that dimension, uh, I know I've got a minimum field area of about 200 feet. I can look at my model rocketry safety code and see that I'm clear to fly B motors there. Uh, but that's all. And, and honestly, you know, I've been to this field. I know it. I wouldn't fly more than that just because I hate losing rockets. Um, so that those are really just fundamental basic tools in Google Maps that you will have uh, to do that. The thing, one of the things I like in Google Earth, again, looking at the same area, is that they have some uh, measurement tools that are radial in nature. So you can kind of zoom this out to understand, you know, what are the real dimensions? And, you know, over here, I've got a, I've got a radius of uh, 100 feet. So this, is, again, is a 200-meter field. I just don't like how many trees are around this compared to the softball fields. So, you know, there's my, there's my radius. I can come out with something more. Uh, more aligned with, again, 200 meter, 200 foot radius. So I've got a four, actually 400 foot field here. Um, do pay attention. <laughs> that, that matters. Um, so, you know, this, this fits my field area nicely without really any risk of trees. Um, so those are ways that I go when I'm just wondering, where am I going to fly? Um, what you may need to know a little more, though, is how do I get permission? So again, if it's a school field, easy enough. Talk to the principal, say, hey, can I fly on this field after hours? Maybe they'll be hard about it. Maybe they won't. But, you know, do the due diligence to ask. Um, a lot of municipalities, counties particularly, are going to have uh, online geographic information systems that are going to list property ownership. And so you can actually identify who owns different properties to go talk to them. Maybe there's some big vacant lot that you never see anyone using. You can track down the property owner and get permission to use that area. Or you can determine if land is owned by the state or the county uh, or federal government. And, and that gives you a place to start to start to track down uh, permission to fly. Um, so field dimensions are obviously an initial consideration. Really key thing is fly the field, not beyond it. Some days you're going to be able to fly at that softball field. Other days it's just too windy. You're going to be landing everything in the private property and just don't do that. It's no fun. If you're out there with kids doing this, um, you know, they're not having fun doing that. Uh, you're spending your time jumping fences and pissing off neighbors. So that's not where to go. Think about neighboring hazards. Is it a busy road next door? Um, a lake? That's going to be a bummer for you. Uh, so these, these, these factor where you choose to use. Or how busy is it? And what is the fire hazard? Not just in general, but on that day. So when you are looking to certify, I want to um, kind of think about, these are the things I like to see when people come to certify. You should have your fully assembled rocket, not, you know, I, I couldn't figure out how to put my retainer on. 
How do I do that? You know, that tells me you're not fully prepared. Maybe we should be doing this next month. Happy to talk to you about it and sort that out, but let's not be rushed. Um, and with your rocket, you should be able to explain how you built it. What kind of epoxy did you use? Uh, what did you use to reinforce this particular part? Or um, in particular, there's a lot of simulation data that you can help find out. Where's your center of gravity? Where's your center of pressure? The center of gravity is really easy to see. It's simply the balance point of your rocket. But make that balance point determination with your motor in it because the motor is going to shift that center of gravity further aft, maybe closer to your center of pressure. Center of pressure is something that your um, the more sophisticated uh, software modeling tools like Open Rocket or Rocksim will tell you. Um, it's you can run the math too. It's it's not easy math, but it's not it's not difficult math. Um, but oftentimes that's going to come that information is going to come with your kit instructions. Um, and you should mark these on your rocket so you can just point to it right in the field and say, here's CG, here's CP, and you want them more than one diameter apart. That is your center of gravity, more than one tube diameter forward of your center of pressure. Um, you need the dry weight and the pad weight. I want to know how heavy you think this is because I'm going to hear what motor you want to fly and, and I'm going to make a spot judgment on whether I think that thrust to weight ratio is going to be good enough. Knowing your thrust to weight ratio will help you do that. If you're really pushing the limits, you know, the absolute minimum is three. Uh, realistically, I want five to 15 uh, is where I like to be. Um, your projected altitude, optimal delay and drill delay. So if, you, if you've got a nine second delay uh, is optimal and you've dr drilled it to eight, as long as you're within a second, you're probably gonna be deploying at a pretty safe speed. And also your descent rate under parachute. We're looking for 20 feet per second or less. If you have a hard desert floor like we do in Tucson, I always aim for more like 15 feet per second. And finally, before we go to Q&A, I wanna talk a little bit about the, the SBR Fusion build highlights. Um, one of the key things I always encourage everyone to do is read through the instructions fully and try to understand what you're doing before you start. Uh, maybe you discover this isn't the rocket for you. Um, we've got the build video linked here. Um, so that's gonna be available to you on YouTube. Um, watch that. It's 90 minutes of build video um, that, you know, I didn't just didn't want to sit you in front of the TV and, and watch, watch through that because I think you can do that on your own time and you can stop it and look through it in a little more detail as you want. Um, one of the other just best practices I always do is dry fit everything first. Don't, you know, don't just like start putting stuff together with epoxy and you make a big mess and then things are stuck where you didn't realize they needed to be. So practice without epoxy first. Um, also, everything that is going to be epoxied make sure you sand it first. And we're talking rough sanding. We're not finished sanding, but take that, you know, that glassined uh, motor tube and rough it up. So that the surface is roughed up and you're able to get some permeation with that epoxy into the, into the cardboard surface. Uh, so that applies mainly to the motor tube and the um, airframe tube. Those outsides are rough. I don't tend to sand the insides of them, but I'm sorry, the outsides are smooth. Uh, so sand them a little bit. You're going to be covering it with epoxy anyway and ultimately painting over it. So it's not going to be an, an unsightly mess. And take your time. And, it, uh, you know, just make sure, you know, you shouldn't be in a rush to do this. You'll make mistakes. You'll be frustrated. And you may make a mistake that affects the safety of your rocket. Uh, but also ask for help. Your, your local NAR section has mentors who are happy to help. And we would much rather hear from you uh, ahead of time, weeks ahead of time so that we can help uh, maybe correct any wrong assumptions you had or help direct you in ways that are gonna be a little more productive. Now, specific to the uh, fusion rocket build questions, um, I found that there's a section uh, where when you're um, using a hammer to tap uh, T-nuts through some holes in the aft centering ring, uh, be careful not to damage your work surface if you care about your work surface, because those are going to poke through a little bit and you're going to you know, scratch the surface. So what, what I used, the kit comes with these centering rings. Uh, so I take two centering rings from the motor adapter assembly and I set them down on my work surface and set the centering ring assembly on top of that to tap it down. That gives it just enough space off my work surface. Um, wasn't immediately clear in the instructions how to glue the motor mount in. So what, what I did is I put a, a bead of epoxy around the inside of the tube, uh, just forward of the fin slots before I slid my motor assembly in there. And basically that means that the middle centering ring is not getting epoxy directly on it. And that's fine because you're going to be gluing the fins in right behind it. There's going to be plenty holding that motor tube into the rocket. 
Uh, but in terms of the forward uh, bead of epoxy for the forward centering ring, make a bead forward of the tube slots or the fin slots so that it's not dripping out the fin slots. And then you slide that motor mount up into that. It should push it forward and make a nice bead all the way around the, the centering ring uh, interface with the airframe. And you'll keep it upright. You can check it looking down at it. Uh, part of this rocket instruction uses a coupler tube to slide down in from the forward end of the airframe tube to rest right against that forward centering ring. And they said, the instructions say to put a bead three inches below the forward end and then shove that coupler tube into that. I think you need a little bit more room than that because you're, what you're going to do is you're going to smear epoxy along the inside of the tube and that could interfere with your payload bay coupler that needs to not have any epoxy anywhere near it or any roughness. So I think four inches is a little better spacing for that. And as you're sending that, that stiffener couple, coupler down there, be twisting it so that it's smearing that epoxy as much as it can and getting it in there. The instructions also rightly use one of the, one of the second couplers to, uh, to help push that, that first coupler all the way in. When you do that, that's all well and good, but just make sure to pull it out nice and quickly and then check for any epoxy that's left that might get in the way of your payload bay coupler. Sanity check the placement of your rail button holes. When you do that, um, just there are some specific measurements where, where you're told to place the rail button holes. What I like to do is make sure those, those rail buttons anchor into the centering rings. And those placements are close, but your specific build is going to be just slightly off. So, you know, mount those things at places you can add a little adhesive, some CA glue or epoxy into the hole first and then screw in. And I like that to have, you know, the wood of a centering ring around it. So what I did is I measured down from the forward end of the airframe tube to figure out where exactly my forward centering ring is on that motor mount. And then I drilled in there. Uh, another thing is there's a point at which we are um, drilling holes to hold the rivets. Uh, here at the nose cone, uh, these go through and through, but those rivets open up in the back. Kind of they, they flare out at the back when you insert the rivet into, into the inside part. And a 530 second hole is the right size to get that in before it's assembled. But once you've, uh, once you've got it in there and pushed the rivet all the way in, the back end is going to open up some, and you need a slightly bigger hole through the uh, nose cone coupler. Uh, to allow that to expand properly. Otherwise, you're going to break the rivet or damage your rocket. So once you've drilled the 5 30 seconds holes through through both of them and, and got them all aligned, got them hardened with a little thin, super thin CA, then you can uh, then you can redrill that that inside nose cone coupler with three six with a three sixteenths bit. And that right there is the end of our presentation today. So let me take a look at these at some QA questions we've got and we'll get those answered. If you have any questions, just click on your Q&A tab and we'll run through them. Uh, so I see we have a, I need an eight second delay on a motor and the options are drilling seven and nine seconds. Is it preferable to, to, to de deploy before or after Apogee? Great question. I tend to go a little bit before. And the reason for that is, in my experience, most of the simulation software tends to be a little overly optimistic, or maybe I just do a lousy job of, of providing a good finish on my rockets. And so my rockets tend to underperform the simulations. And so when I'm hedging my bets, I'm going to err a little bit on the shorter side. Uh, Cliff is asking, um, why talk about range selection when the first slides are encouraged participation in a club? Uh, because I think it's important to, even when you're participating with a group, understand the basics. Um, and you know, chances are you may be flying model rockets out with with kids sometime, and knowing those basics, I think, is is pretty important. Um, and then Frank is asking uh, how to thrust, how is thrust to weight to ratio calculated? Average thrust, total impulse, max thrust, initial thrust. That is a good idea, and I don't know ex exactly how. Um, thrust curve calculates it, but I think the critical factor is initial thrust. You know, what are you coming up, what are you coming up to uh, on initial thrust? Um, because what you need to be doing is getting your rocket moving. And because if it's not stable when it comes off the rail and that's about a tenth of a second into flight, then you're not going to be stable. But I will check on that and follow up. Let's see. These slides will be available online. 
Um, so yeah, we just, uh, I don't know exactly the format that they'll be, but uh, part of the deal of Narcon is these slides are available exclusively to attendees for 30 days, and then they're gonna be made available to the general public. And the link for the live build video is uh, right here on, on uh, this slide about the three inch uh, Fusion build highlights. So we can click through there and it is sitting here at YouTube. Before. And so, you know, there's kind of, we start out with a whole, it's an hour and a half more or less. And so that's where it is. Um, a switch band. Um, switch band does not come into play in, in this rocket. Um, Kevin is asking, what is a switch band? Um, a switch band is um, basically, it's, a, it's usually about an inch wide uh, section of airframe tube that will go into the coupler. So basically on this, on our, uh, on our uh, fusion rocket here, uh, you know, we've got a payload bay right here and we've got some electronics that we talk about putting in there. Um, if you had electronics hiding inside your, inside this bulkhead section in the coupler, you could have a separate strip of, of airframe tube that goes in here that is glued to that coupler tube and allows you typically to have some holes through there that you could reach in and press buttons to activate electronics. And so it basically sits in there and allows that to uh, allows you to have access to that easily without having to you know take your nose cone off and do all that. But you know when you're out on the pad, you want this sitting there so you can actually uh, turn electronics off and on that way. <clears throat> and let's see, build video in the chat. I can link to the build video in the chat. One other thing I want to mention is that, <coughs> excuse me, um, this rocket is a great mo is a great platform for flying various electronics, and Will Marchant has a as a program. I, I don't know if it's later today or if, if it's tomorrow, um, and he's talking about Arduino on board. And so this kit, uh, the Virtual Narcon kit, comes with this uh, this altimeter bay mount. Uh, which is specifically designed to support Arduino use. Uh, and this is basically how it looks assembled. Um, it's easy enough to assemble from the parts. Basically, just glue them together. One end has, you know, top mark. This is the bottom. Here's the top. There's arrows here indicating which way is up. And uh, there's a lot of different things you can fly in here. But if you're flying Arduino on here, these two little rails are intended for you to drill holes through some of these markings. And... Uh, and use those as anchors for your Arduino devices. So I know Will Marchant is doing uh, a session tomorrow, I think it is, on uh, on the uh, making use of Arduino technology in, in rocket flights, the different components you can add to Arduino to uh, to make things, uh, you know, to, to measure altitude, uh, acceleration, various things. So definitely worth seeing if you haven't. And uh, if you've got if you've got our uh, if you've got SBR rocket three three inch fusion kit, this is this is a great uh, addition to it. Um, this is an int another interesting topic to me. Um, First off, let me make sure we get that build video in the chat, not just in the Q&A. Um, so Bill is asking about thoughts on requiring a written exam for level one. Personally, I think it'd be a great thing. Um, you know, simply because I learned a lot in the process of studying for that level two exam. So NAR requires an exam uh, for level two certification and, and, and If you're working with a mentor on level one, I think you, you know, you, it, it's easy enough to be plenty safe, but the things you learn about the regulatory framework, the launch site dimensions and other requirements, uh, and, and you know, just the, the, there's questions about you know, the proper adhesives to use for different situations, um, you know, purpose behind vent holes, for example, the, you know, the, you know, something great to talk about. Uh, this, this rocket involved, uh, the instructions uh, list drilling a vent hole here forward of the uh, forward centering ring. And the reason for that vent hole, you'd think, well, that's just going to let our ejection exhaust out, right? Well, no, it's really too small to do that. That's that's all happening very quick. 
this isn't going to leak enough ejection gas to prevent the, the payload bay from sliding off. That is there to help equalize pressure as your rocket is climbing. If you're flying certainly upwards of a mile, you're going to have a significant uh, pressure difference between ground level and, uh, and apogee. And what can happen is your uh, airframe bay can overpressurize. And uh, that can that can be disastrous if it overpressurizes to the extent where it pushes your your coupler your payload coupler out, uh, where it, uh, it it's going to be early deployment. You're going to zipper everything, probably shred your rocket. Um, so it's a it's a sudden unscheduled disassembly. And I think I've covered all the questions. I know we're coming down within five minutes of our time, but I'm happy to sit and keep answering questions. You can just answer, ask them in Q&A. Oh, I'm seeing over in chat, Thomas is asking, where are these questions asked? If you look uh, just below your name in the upper right of your uh, Excel events screen, there's a Q&A tab. And there's currently nine Q&A questions. <laughs> I see. So Thomas is pointing out that these questions are mostly being sent privately to me from, from attendees. Um, and uh, so I'm reading them uh, out and describing what, what my, my take on them is. I'm just looking through chat, though, just in case anyone else is... Okay, so, so yeah, so Will Marshana said the Arduino Altimeter talk is right after the NAR Town Hall. Good to know. Okay, Kevin asked, are the rivets uh, a necessary thing? Uh, the answer is no, the rivets are not absolutely necessary, but they are convenient for providing fairly quick access to your payload section, your, and, and fairly quick and secure access. Uh, your other option might be you know, applying tape to the nose cone coupler to keep that on safely, but um, my son's uh, certification flight, uh, you know, that was the strategy he used, and we saw the, the tracking altimeter uh, jump right out of the payload bay when he when his nose cone separated at Apogee. So that's uh, that, that that's that, that's a trade off you make. Uh, so Joe is asking where the model is sold, and you can find it at SBR Rocketry. I think fusionrocket.biz or .com or .org is the is the URL. So uh, this is uh, Scott Binder owns uh, SBR, and uh, this is this is a kit that he's he's had around for a while, and so it's available there. So if you look for SBR uh, Rocket, SBR Rocketry, you'll find it there. Um, Thomas has asked, um, thrust curve only looks at mass and thrust, not stability. Is that correct? And um, short answer to that is yes, because basically the parameters about the model you're putting in are the mass and the diameter. Um, it does not ask where your center of gravity is. Um, that's going to have to be something you figure out. The Open Rocket and RockSim both do a great job of visually providing that information to you, so you get a much better idea of where it is in those programs. Um, Mark is asking, do you like rail buttons for no rod whip? Um, and the answer is yes. And actually, there's a lot of considerations right now. Um, for, clubs are increasingly requiring rails for mid-power and up. Um, so I know at Southern Arizona Rocketry Association, we now require rails for F motors and up. Um, it just, yeah, it limits rod whip and uh, minimizes the number of times we see rockets accidentally arcing over the crowd. Um, because the rod flexed unexpectedly as the rocket went up. And Henry has asked, is there a specific age that you need to be to get certified? And the answer is yes, 18 is where, where you can get your level one certification. And you can get your level two and level three after that. Uh, level one certs cover H and I motors. Level two is J through L. And then level three is M through O. 
uh, in the class two rockets. Um, however, um, Tripoli has a Tripoli mentoring program that starts at age 12. It really is simply, that's a test. Uh, kids take a test and then they have basically a, a, they call it a certification, but it's really, it's, it's knowledge that it's certification that you have knowledge to be safe on the field. Uh, so that, so that you could be out there operating safely on the range. Um, NARS program of junior certification is, is starts at 14. Um, but under federal regulations, um, it's high power rocketry is 18 and up. And so these junior certifications, really, there's an adult who is the flyer of record for every flight. But it definitely it allows kids to take the exam so that they're educated about a lot of the same questions that would be on the level two exam. Um, and they're working with an adult mentor to prepare their, you know, to build their rocket, to prepare their rocket for flight, to show that they, they know what they're doing, and then for flying. So anyway, thank you everyone for joining today.